could not bluff. I wasn't doing anything. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I have a full house. That's my poker reference. We don't play poker, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is a part of the show. <laughs> All right. So, what happened was that went nuts, and it didn't pass the Senate. And the big issue for the South was twofold. First off, the senatorial balance. And the South could do the math. Immigrants were going to the North, and that would skew the House towards the South. I'm sorry, towards the North. But now the South is saying, we need Missouri as a slave state to keep senatorial balance between slave states and free states. Slave states and free states. We have to keep senatorial balance. That became the cry for the South. As long as there is equal number of slave states as free states, the Senate will be preserved. So the Talmadge Amendment passed the House, failed in the Senate. But there's one more reason, and it goes back to Thomas Jefferson, and the reason is diffusion. Diffusion was Thomas Jefferson's dream, or vision, I guess is a better way to put it, on how slavery would go away. Diffusion meant this, and let me explain it before I show the map, talk about what I put in the maps. If you limit the number of slaves coming in, so limit slaves coming in, and then allow for the slaveholders to kind of spread out. So the number of slaves is kind of spread out over the country. You can get rid of slavery. Diffuse the slaveholders and the slaves throughout the country. You lower the percentage of slaveholders, eventually states can get rid of slavery on their own. So. You limit slaves coming in, the number of slaves and slaveholders drops, and eventually states like what happened in the north, it will happen for the rest of the country. And so southerners are saying we need to spread out <coughs> slave states so then the numbers will drop and we get rid of slavery someday. That's why Jefferson signed the bill stopping the slave trade back in 1808. That was to limit the number of slaves coming in. Now, the thing was that it's not going to work because of the Industrial Revolution. But that was the idea. But there's something else, too, that fits in with diffusion. If they start limiting the slaves and states in the north had post-native emancipation, but now you allow for Missouri. And other states with relatively low slave populations like Delaware. Maryland, Kentucky and Virginia, and Maryland, all seriously considered post native emancipation. Now think about post native emancipation. If you have diffusion and a law for post native emancipation, what happened is all the slaves will be sold down river. What's gonna happen to the percentage of slaves that has already happened here? It will skyrocket. And so not only will there be more slaveholders, and they'll never get rid of slavery, but the percentage of slaves to free person will keep going up and up and up. Yeah. So the three fifths compromise still in effect now. Yeah, three fifths compromise still in effect. It wouldn't go away to the to the. Uh, it might give these more power, but if less states have slavery, if you have more a greater percentage of slaves in the population, that increases the threat of what? Exactly. And that's what you have to get. Southerners started saying, if we don't have diffusion and lost slavery to spread, you're condemning the deep south. The slave rebellion. That's what you have to get. It was an overriding fear of slave rebellion. You're condemning us to slave rebellion. Because what happened is, you can see in this picture here, this one doesn't show it as well. It looked kind of cool, and then I should, it's really hard to follow. Pretty high percentage is here, but they started selling more and more down here. The slave percentage here was much greater than any place else. Darker colors, more slaves. Virginia had a lot, but they feared slave rebellion first. And by the way, can you guess the first state you to see from the Union from that picture right there? South Carolina. What's the darkest one? You said it? South Carolina. South Carolina. Can you guess number two? 
Mississippi. Because they're the ones most worried that if we have some place to get rid of slavery, all the slaves will be sold here, which of course they kind of wanted for money, but slave revolt. You're condemning us to slave revolt. And they'll talk about this over and over and over and over and over again. And it's one thing they talk about contemporary, <coughs> the contemporary uh, books, journals, speeches were about this. 50 years after the Civil War, Southerners will totally go away from this. They said, it was never, we treated our slaves so nice. No! Have you seen what? And so, what happened was this. With the fear of slave rebellion and senatorial violence, Southerners said, if Missouri doesn't come in as a free state, we'll do what? Secede. Secede. They're talking civil war. I mean, me like overnight. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're giving us slave power, both any emancipation. That was seen as kind of the modern view. And all of a sudden, boom, they're talking civil war. And there's fist fights in the cloakroom of the United States Senate in the House. Everything tore apart. I mean, that fast, boom, civil war. Yeah. If, if, if I said Missouri enters as a slave state, I'm sorry. If Missouri enters as a free state and not a slave state, South threatened to secede. Oh, okay. If I said it wrong, I'm sorry. So Missouri better be a slave state, period. A compromise was developed called the Missouri Compromise. And it dealt with the two issues. It didn't really deal with them. What it did is it pushed it down the road. What it did is this. First part of the Missouri Compromise. The actual compromise that came up to solve this problem. First one, Missouri will come in as a slave state. And it will be balanced by Maine. Maine was part of Massachusetts, and now it will be a, will be a free state. Everyone got that? Missouri slave, Maine free. Got that one? Missouri slave, Maine free. And then for the rest of the territories, it only applies to the territories. For the rest of the territories, they came, they came up with an arbitrary line, which was the southern border of Missouri territory. And this latitude line would become almost like a sacred line in the years leading up to the Civil War. Right down 36, 30. The latitude line, 36 degrees, 30 minutes, 36, 30, 36, 30, 36, 30. 36, 30. That will be the dividing line. This territory is in the north, will be free. And that's going to be called free soil and no slavery. <laughs> south, slavery. But remember, the United States only has the Louisiana Purchase. On the surface, it looked like a big southern advantage. But let's be clear about it. They're planning on taking the whole thing. They're already talking about it. Yeah. And so with that, a compromise would happen. A compromise came, and what happened to the compromise? It didn't pass. It didn't pass. Good degree on it. Southerners hated the 3630 line. Northerners hated Missouri coming in as a slave state. Didn't pass. And that's where a man who's going to get the nickname the Great Compromiser came in and arguably saved the country. His name? Henry Clay. Henry Clay came up with the great idea, thus he will be the great compromiser. Henry Clay of Kentucky. By the way, portraits were done a lot like this. You notice he's pointing down. If you point down at a picture, it increases your stature. You look taller. You look more uh, like you're in command. You think about it. Two or so. If you're looking up, it looks like you're looking up to somebody who's in command. Well, Henry Clay, what he did is he divided it into two bills. He divided it. Missouri and Maine for one bill, 3630 in the other bill. And they would pass separately. It was a brilliant compromise. Missouri and Maine, Southerners voted for that. 3630, Northerners voted, enough Northerners voted for it. Compromise passed. What a brilliant idea. So simple. Separate bills passed both the House and the Senate. And literally, overnight, the bill passed, we saved the Union. 
everybody rejoiced. I mean, just, we saved it. The country is saved. Arguably, yeah, the country was saved. But it just pushed the problem down the road. It did not solve the problem of slavery and territories and these two systems developing. It just allowed for the country to continue growing without civil war. There'd be another crisis like this 13, year, um, 13 years later, another one in 1844, and then 1850, it was really close, then 1854, 1859, and then finally they blow that thing up. But the thing was, if it would have happened in 1820, I couldn't survive that. And so the Missouri Compromise was a major compromise. Henry Clay, he would always therefore be known as a great compromise. He thought he would ride this to the presidency. And so the era of good feelings, you could argue, was over, but nobody really wanted to acknowledge it. You're like, oh, we're back together. One more thing we have to write about this era, the Monroe Doctrine of 1823. There's Monroe. And that's a picture done after the fact. Jeff, what do you got to break the law? It wasn't like that at all. The Monroe Doctrine, and all of you are now very busily writing down no European intervention of Western Hemisphere. <coughs> In the Hemisphere, the hemisphere, that's how they pronounce it back then. Read the manuals. No, in the hemisphere, it, it was a pronouncement by President Monroe. It is not a law. It is just he basically issued a, a letter that said, the United States will allow no foreign intervention in the Western Hemisphere. I'm simplifying it a little bit. Intervention means military intervention. What he's talking about is no more, no additional European colonies in the Western Hemisphere. You know, Canada's already a British colony there. That's fine. But what it's saying is the United States will not allow that. Now, the United States could not enforce that. Let me give you a little background. 1819-1821 is what you have to get. Latin America all won their independence. Latin America, virtually all of it, won their independence. Who colonized most of Latin America? What two countries? Spain, Spain and Portugal. Portugal. Portugal was Brazil. The rest of Latin America was Spain. Hmm? So, Spain and Portugal. Almost all of it lost. New Mexico won their independence in 1821. Britain and the United States were really worried that European countries, specifically the new monarchy in France, would try to carve those places up. Or maybe Spain might come back. No. Louis XVIII. Okay, so after. Before. And there were the word, both Britain and the United States, they were going to issue a joint proclamation but couldn't come up with the words. So the U.S. just did it. The U.S. could never enforce this. Ironically, and we got the, now this part we have to get the Royal Navy enforced it. Remember, they just fought a major war 10 years earlier. The Royal Navy, the threat of it, kept out foreign intervention. Now, France is going to try. France will try in the 1860s to colonize Mexico. They put their own guy on the throne. That heard of Single de Mayo? That's kicking out Maximilian, who the French tried to put in there. So what did the Royal Navy come about with that? The British did not want any other countries coming and colonizing either. Weak republics would be easier to exploit economically. Everybody forgot about the Monroe Doctrine. It was just a speech. I mean, literally, it just was put away. As was, uh, there was an important statement by the president. It's not law. By the 1880s, it's basically forgotten. But it started to come back in the 1890s when America became very strong. And then Teddy Roosevelt would dust it off. And it would become the basis of American foreign policy again. Because, here's the key point. If no Europeans can intervene, it's implying that the U.S. thinks what country can intervene? The U.S. can intervene. And it's going to set up something called big stick diplomacy. So we will come back to the Monroe Doctrine. Big stick. Mm -hmm. And so, with that, the air of good feelings is ready to blow up. Write down. The Jacksonian era. There he is, everybody. Oh, he went great very young. He had a very hard life. Hard life. He was an orphan, brutally mistreated.
he did run messages and was kind of a spy for the revolutionaries when the uh, Revolutionary War he was captured. He was actually beaten and slashed across the face by a British officer because he refused to essentially kneel and kiss his fleet, his foot. And by the way, i got to be clear about this. That kind of fits in with Jackson's persona. He's the toughest man ever to live. I have no doubt about it. If Andrew Jackson walked through this door right now, we would be terrified. Partially because he had been dead, he'd been dead for 170 years. That would frighten me. But also, Jackson, just imagine a guy about six foot one, six foot two, and about 140 pounds. Uh, well, what was his nickname? Okay, hickory is a kind of a tree. And what would hickory, what would, um, what, a hickory, what would hickory branches be used for? Switches. Yeah, switches to beat people. Thin but very strong. That was Andrew Jackson. Hickory. His nickname would be Paul Hickory. But Jackson would come to represent this changing America with the Industrial Revolution. And he would come to represent arguably many of the things that we take the most pride of as the United States. <coughs> and also some of the things that we have reason to potentially be very embarrassed about in the United States. Jackson is a great American. Hard, sure. Hard to find somebody who has more influence than Andrew Jackson. Jackson is either the hero, the soldier, or a monarch, a king who ruled like a tyrant. So, you don't have to write these down, just a couple things. We already talked about this. Remember the Battle of Horseshoe Bend? He would become a hero for that. New Orleans, even a bigger hero. What happened in Florida, and he had the great nickname. It's not old, it's old Hickory. And you're going to find politician after politician who's going to try to emulate old Hickory. They have a cool nickname like old Hickory. Don't mess with old Hickory. So, a couple of things, Bob, I'm not going to show you this quote. We have to get the election of 1824, because this is where Jackson would come onto the national scene. This would make Andrew Jackson. <laughs> Mine would not want to be president again. Five men did. Yeah. How were, uh, how were candidates chosen on this time? Candidates were chosen in a very confusing way. There's no real set piece way to do it. And there's technically only one party. And so what happened is the Republicans in Congress would pick one person. But then also Republicans just from an area like the South chose somebody, from the North just chose somebody, and kind of a, by acclamation chose somebody. There was no real set piece, they were just doing it, the only way to describe it is ad hoc. Just We just gotta find a way to do it. They would have to come up with set rules. Eventually conventions would do it. And so five men wanted to be president. All Republicans, five of them. Henry Clay, the choice of the establishment, the choice of Republicans in Congress, the Speaker of the House, the great compromiser, has his American system. John Quincy Adams, who had one big egg head. John Quincy Adams, the choice of the North, his father was president. He was Secretary of State. Crawford of Georgia was the choice of the southern elite planters. And so you had this three people. And then the choice of the people. The hero. The most famous man in America, Andrew Jackson. So you have William. You have Clay, Adams, Crawford, and Jackson. The fifth man realized, ah, that's too many. Who was the fifth man? The fifth man decided, I'll be the vice president. And so whoever's going to be elected president, the vice president is going to be the one person for all, no matter who elected. You know who? Where are you doing that to me? There he is. John. C. Calhoun. Wait, wait. I know. All the men want to grow neck hair. All the women in the class say, oof. 
right? That is the ideal man. Someday I will marry the man. He's dead. Sorry. Now, that's how. And so that should give you an idea how just bitterly divided, but still this was all new. Well, we're we're, we're going to do with this. Everyone's fighting for the roots of the Republican Party. Well, the election would turn out to be nobody won the majority. The Electoral College, Jackson got the most electors, but only 38%. Nobody had the majority. The top three then go to the House. So right down, the election went to the House. And then Crawford got very ill. So basically, it's between Adams and Jackson. By the way, you should notice one more little graph here. You notice a little pie chart? Popular vote. This is the first election in American history that a significant number of states allowed the voters to choose the electors in their state, like what we do today. And so there are actually people who are 43% who are voting for electors pledged to vote for Jackson. <coughs> That's what it is today. They vote for electors pledged to them. So there are more states are allowing voters and not state assembly. The United States is changing from the very elite system that did it to more and more of the people deciding. Well, it went to the House, and that's where we get to what's called the corrupt bargain. Who called the corrupt bargain? Obviously the person who felt cheated. It's not necessarily corrupt if you're these two men. Henry Clay and John Quincy Adams. Adams supported Clay's American system. Therefore, Clay supported Adams. Clay wanted to be president, can't be Adams. Clay, Speaker of the House. He has great influence on the House if they vote for president. So, Adams wins in the House. Adams is president, even though Jackson had more electors than, than Adams, Adams is elected president. Remember, it's John Quincy Adams. I didn't write down the Quincy. John Adams is, uh, is still alive. Well, as payback, and there's no doubt they talked about this. Adams appoints Henry Clay as Secretary of State. This is a big deal because Jefferson was Washington's Secretary of State. Madison was Jefferson. Monroe was Madison's. Adams was Monroe's. It seemed like Secretary of State was the stepping stone to, pre to the presidency. And so it seemed like a deal was made. Clay made Adams president. Adams making Clay his successor. <coughs> and that is what Jackson supporters said. It's a crop argument. His supporters said we were cheated. They manipulate the Constitution. They went against, and here's the key point, the will of the people. The people wanted Jackson. Well, we can argue about that. Still significant numbers of people could not vote. No women could vote. Only white men, and for most places, still white men with property. But the corrupt bargain, this would forever change Jackson, who is convinced that the elite were against him already, which they hated him. Now this is proof. The elite got together in a little cabal and elected this angry salamander. That is John Quincy Adams. Oops. John Quincy Adams. The Adams administration would be a disaster for Adams. Jackson supporters were so determined to stop Adams and everything he did, to stop him, to not allow him to do what he wanted, so determined that Adams' administration turned into a disaster. A little like, I mean, you could make, there's actually a similarity between Adams' administration and what's happening today. You, the opposition party today is just determined to make sure that nothing that the president wants passed. Same thing as that. And so there's going to be a rematch. There's going to be a rematch in 1828. The angry salamander against this fine, noble man who would gladly kill you if you disagreed with him. Andrew Jackson. Hey, when his favorite saying is, oh, damn nation, I'll hang them all, and he meant it, yeah. doesn't he look like an angry salamander? <laughs> and so, 
once you say it, you cannot unsee it. This was a dirty campaign. And there's two things we have to get. Very dirty. First off, a great scam by the Democrats. Write down the tariff of 1828. The tariff of 1828. Now, Adams supported the American system. And so Adams wanted a higher protective tariff. And the Democrats played a trick on him. Okay, you want a higher tariff? We'll propose the super, super high tariff of 60 to 75% tax. A massive tariff. That's what the Democrats proposed. A, a, I'm sorry, a 50 to 75% tariff, mostly on textiles. If Adams vetoes that, it's the tariff is too high. The price is well too much. If Adams vetoes it, he looks like a hypocrite. If he signs it, they could say Adams signed this big tax, raising your prices. What did Adams do? He signed it. And then what did Democrats do? Well, I'm saying I'm calling them Democrats. They're not quite called Democrats yet. They're supporters of Jackson, who will soon be called Democrats. They'll soon be called Democrats. So if I call them Democrats, I mean they're the supporters of Jackson. Is that, is that okay? Not confused? Okay. And then what did they do? They turned around and said, how dare Adam sign this massive tax that's going to crush you? This this, what he signed, is better called a tariff of abominations, which is awesome. Isn't that great? They do the tariff, and then they turn around and say, how dare he sign this? They actually didn't believe he would. And so Adams was hurt by this. And one more thing that greatly affected this. Jackson's wife, Rachel. Jackson's wife, Rachel, who was very ill by the election of 1828, would be bitterly attacked. This is actually from a little thing. Um, this is actually a copy of a very popular trinket that went around after it. But Jackson's wife, well, she was she divorced. And she was bitterly attacked for not only being a divorcee, which is seen as, as very, very tawdry. Obviously, there's something wrong with her. Loose morals. There's something else. Rachel, when Jackson met her, she was very poor. Basically living on her own, even though she was still technically married, and she worked in a tavern. So they imply she worked in a tavern. She must be what? Prostitute. A prostitute. Which, of course, is garbage. And one more thing. This is the actual divorce decree. And they sent it off to a judge. Then they could get married. They got married two days before the judge signed it. So technically, they're living in sin, and Rachel yeah, is committing, well, not only adultery, but polygamy. And so, actually, it's not enough. Yeah, um, the word is gone. Plural marriage is what they would have called it then. And she was bitterly attacked then. Look at these. The thing was, it was a very elitist argument. Look at these low class. Look at these almost heathen likes. Adam's supporters assumed, oh, everyone's going to go against him. Actually, more and more common men are voting. And they looked at it as, you're attacking the life that we have to live because of who we are. This is the way our life is. We have to take jobs that are very difficult. We have to work really hard. And sometimes marriages are done with horrible people. We have to get divorced. That's the way life is. And they actually supported it. And it didn't work. It backfired. Both the, this backfired against the elites and terrible abominations hurt Adams. The election was a blowout, an absolute blowout. The term will soon be landslide. Jackson won big. And here's one of the great ironic twists about this. Guess who Jackson's vice president was? John C. Calhoun. John C. Calhoun was Adams' vice president. And he so hated Adams that he thought Jackson would support um, Big Plantation. Why was he wrong there? He jumped to Jackson. So the sitting vice president actually helped run against the current president. It would be like in 2012 if Joe Biden, who was, who was Obama's vice president, joined the ticket with Mitt Romney. I mean, it's just so totally wrong. It couldn't happen, but that's what happened. 
And that is a fantastic place to quit. Tomorrow, we'll do a few things, and then I'll tell you a dueling story. And you'll, after this dueling story, you will decide that Andrew Jackson was the toughest man ever to live. What have you done with Cody? I'm Cody, I'm Taylor. She was wrapped in trash. Yeah. Alrighty then, what a great day! Oh, by the way, if you had to see me on your paper, I think someone did come see me, but overall, nice essay. That's what I think in my head. Could someone hit one of the lights, please? Thanks. Yeah, I'm going to have to change that. No, you guys did good. Really good. But also, you just kind of get used to it. You figure it out. You know the routine. Oh, I finally didn't have a week. This is on my paper. Yeah. Yeah, you fat. What's that? And you didn't do it. Well, what do you want me to do about it? Well, you turn in, but I don't know if we give any credit. But the only way you get extra credit is not everything turned in. Why did you do it? I did. I couldn't find it. Why did you ask? I could give you another copy. You get it to me, get it to me tomorrow, and we'll see, okay?